Well, good afternoon to you. Welcome. Thanks for joining today. I've got a very exciting guest today. It is uh, someone I've been trying to chat to for a while is to understand high performance teams as it relates to machinery and uh, building something robust, something race worthy and something uh, impressive. I think you'll agree with me that uh, to build something that can erase the Dakar rally is incredible. So Terence Marsh is the CEO of Redline. They build race ready cars for customers and uh, they support them in the Dakar rally too. So we're going to get into it. I'm looking forward to it. Remember, this is your show to ask your questions and uh, get stuck in. My name's Alex MacPhail, and this is High Performance Teams. Terence, good afternoon to you. Thank you for your time and joining me today. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I just muted you there. Sorry, Terence. Thank you for joining me. How are you today? All is good. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to this, Terence. So um, uh, let's let's dive into uh, redlined and racing and cars. I mean, if you just look at that picture of that car spinning up the dust, we were talking just a minute ago. It's not really a car as you imagine a car to be. You go to the shop, buy a, a Toyota, and this and whatever it is. You actually build from the ground up. For, you know, it doesn't matter what shell is. You called it a dress earlier. What is a T1 race car? And uh, maybe just explain what is a T1 race car and we can pick up the conversation from there. Yeah, look, T1 is very much the equivalent to Formula One, um, but the cross country version. So basically the, the best cars or the highest level of cars built in the world are referred to as the T1s. Um, and that's the category that we manufacture and what we build. Um, and have basically built our business over the last eight years. Okay, so I mean, as it, as it relates to cars that do rally and endurance thing, the buck stops here. This is the, the, the top end of it. Think supercars and, uh, and they drive on dirt. Yeah, I think that's the, the, the word off-road supercars is probably the best way to, to, to explain them. You know, over the years, the regulations have changed. Um, if I go back 10, 15 years ago, we, uh, we would take a, a, a Navara or a Ford Ranger or a Toyota Hilux and you, you would take a road going car and you build a race car using that ladder chassis. And, and that's, uh, you know, upgraded suspension and uh, other work, electronic work was done on it. But, you know, I think 10, 10 odd years ago, they, they started building space frame chassis. And I think the first was the BMW X3, you know, where you weren't using ladder chassis anymore. And the rules then opened up for uh, these space frame chassis. And I think in, in 2012, we built our first one. So the reality is they all tend to be very similar under the skin, as we call it. Um, obviously, there's a couple of personal things. Um, but you choose your, you build your chassis, you choose your engine, you choose all the componentry, uh, the suspension, and you build within the regulations. Okay. Well, that sounds interesting. I mean, I think you're really, you're really talking terms that, uh, that I'm not 100% familiar with. But before we get too deep on the technical, which is somewhere I do want to go, can we just backpedal a little bit? Now, you've been building race cars for, for 10 plus years now. But uh, let's go back to Terence as a youth, as a, a you know, formative years. You know, what was your thoughts on, on cars, on racing, on mechanics? I mean, did, did you envisage as a teenager that one day you'll be building race cars for the Dakar Rally? Not at all. Absolutely not at all. I, I, you know, fresh out of school, I actually uh, I ended up playing cricket for a living. So I played uh, professional cricket until I was about, I think I retired at 29. Um, my father was very much involved in, in, in motorsports and, and loved it. He was very mechanically minded. Um, so I had, it influenced me in a way, but it wasn't something I really I thought I would be doing. Um, you know, I, I, I rode a lot of motorbikes. I did that as a youngster and, and, and did things like motocross. And later on in life, I went back to two wheels and I, uh, I, did, I did things like the Roof of Africa, which is one of the toughest events in the world. I did that five times. I did the Desert 1000 on a bike. And it was only later on that I, I kind of, you know, I say with age comes a cage, you know, and I got myself in a roll cage. So, no, everything was ball sports. It was, uh, you know, average average uh, school, you know, put as much time as I need to, never put enough time in, but uh, concentrate a lot on ball sports. I played football and I played cricket. Um, and then in those days, we still had to do, you know, our military service. So I did my military service. And then I went overseas and I played cricket for four years overseas. Um, got back, got involved in business. And that was the journey that eventually got me in uh, at the age of 29 is when I actually got involved in, uh, let's call it this uh, cross-country racing. 
Okay, but I mean, you, I want to just uh, zoom in on some things there. So, if you're involved in playing sport professionally or any sport, but I mean, cricket is a is a good example too. I mean, this is a high performance team to, to work in your sport. You know, as a professional, uh, it's what pays the bills. It's your passion, but it's also it's something that you you actively working on day by day to improve your skill set and to make the team better and hopefully win and, and build up in the league and then win the league and you know go up to the next league, etc. So you you've got that um, bedrock foundation of delivering the goods and, and building and improving every day. Um, I think that, that might tie nicely into how you ended up building and, and improving in a, in a race environment. Okay, so it's no longer a ball in a field, it's now a machine and a, and a track. But um, what was the jump between sort of ending a professional cricket and then getting into uh, motorsport? I mean, did you, or, or mechanics of motorsport, did you end up doing any training course or did you just then spend more time with your father with the with the racing or was there a course that you did what was your your route from no, cricket it, to it's, okay if I, if I pick up what you you know i think the biggest thing is that in in professional sport change rooms change rooms for me became no different than a boardroom you know i was a i was fortunate enough that i captained most of the teams that i played for so um i understood leadership roles i understood team dynamics i understood how critical the sum of is greater than how everybody had a part to play you know and i always believed in having flat structures, even though you might be the captain, you'd have responsibilities, but I thought, you know, everybody needed to contribute. So it was just taking those existing skills, uh, the disciplines, you know, if you think in yeah. sport, we need to be very disciplined to play at a, at a professional level. Um, sure. If we wanted to win, we needed to have good strategies, you know, and then we had to, 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 to train and build up our, our team around those strategies, you know, and there were objectives and there were goals, uh, which are, honestly yeah. is no different from business. So the transition into business was, actually quite easily you know if you wanted to if you want to do better than someone else you had to strategize and you had to train and you had to research whatever it was so i found mm -hmm. that transition quite uh, quite easy um and obviously the ability to work with people uh, is quite critical yeah. you know and i spent a lot of my my career, career coaching as well you know um which there's, there's obviously things that you learn there as well um but on the performance side you kind of understand what needs to happen and when you take those same disciplines and that same dedication and those same working parameters into business, it's it's a, it's an easy transition, you know. So mm. so that was that was the simplicity of I I, I found myself running between cricket and and um, business, and either I didn't have enough time for business because I was busy with the cricket, or I was too busy with cricket not enough for business. So something had to give, you know. At the age of 29, I, I was fortunate enough to play provincial cricket and I played some representative cricket um, overseas. Um, but it was quite clear I, I wasn't going to have the time or the dedication and I literally wasn't going to make the, the cut in, from a Springbok point, point of view, you know. Tim Noakes had just come in, you know, people were starting to uh, cool down, never mind warm up. So there was a whole chance that it was happening and I, I kind of saw myself on the, on, let's call it the arse end of that, you know. So, so yeah. what I did is uh, I got more, more involved in business, uh, which I found very challenging and I enjoyed, but I really missed the competitive side of things. And I, I missed the fact that when I was playing cricket, I, it was a lot easier for me to get meetings. You, know? uh, you came with some form of credi credibility. You know, you're, you're captain provincial sides. Um, it was easy to talk to people. It's easy to get meetings, to see people, uh, easy okay. to do business. And once I'd taken that away, um, there was a big kind of void in my life and I needed to find something else something to fulfill that and, and that's kind of how the motorsport element came into it i never i never i never i never studied anything i never did anything i really just surrounded myself once i decided that was the route i was going i just made a point of surrounding myself with the best people okay so you you talked about the, the transition from cricket to business with a bit of a, a layover period too what was uh, just curious what was that business what was the first thing business wise you did right from um from cricket was it this uh, red line or is there something else in between no, it, it was a company called Q Display. It was an industry one. I, I, every every year there were four of us that would travel overseas and go and watch, um, you know, be rugby in New Zealand or cricket in, 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 in England. We would go and do a, an international tour. And I was okay. standing in the airport in, uh, in, in, um, in the UK and I was standing in, in the queuing systems, which are very much like seatbelts. A seatbelt system pulls out and, and kind of clicks its way in the next post. And in those days, I'm talking about 1996, we only had uh, the rope system, you know, bollards and ropes. So I was quite, uh, quite, I, I liked the product. I saw there was a, there was a number for it in, in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, I phoned the guys and I set up a meeting and I, after the trip, I flew there. And I basically secured the rights for, for, for Africa for that product, which then I brought in and I distributed 
you know, so if you go to the banks and the city councils and the cinemas, you think everywhere you queue, you stand in a queuing system or barricading, um, yeah. varsities, cinemas, um, casinos. And basically that was the first business that I got involved in. Um, but not, okay. not long into a couple of years into that, I realized that it was, uh, you know, you're, build, you're bringing in boxes and marking up boxes. And I, I preferred the annuity model. I liked something that more annuity involved than uh, one sort of sales, you know? Okay, so you, you're responsible for when I go to the post office and my son fiddles with things and he clicks it off and he makes boxes and shapes and cages and the thing all falls over because he's clicked too many off at the one go. That's your product. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, it's a nice system. So then you brought that in and after a while it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't something that either inspired you or, or the business model, the way of this thing rolling out of the future. You have to keep selling the widget to, to make the money. And uh, okay, so what is the transition out of that? So obviously you've learned a lot to get a, a, the rights to a, a, an international product and get the footprint here in South Africa and Africa, that's a great learning tool as well. I, mean, I think a lot of people think about these things but don't actually do it. So there you've got an example of, you know, seek them out, get the deal and, and sell the product. How do you transition out of that? What's the next step? Yeah, it was an interesting one because it was obviously importing, exporting, um, you know, learning all about their duties, um, then working out that there were certain things that we could manufacture yeah, and not have to bring in because of duties. So they got involved in manufacturing some of the products here and only actually bringing the, the belt cassettes in. Um, and then from there, uh, as I said to you, 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 someone would want a gold post and I had a silver post. Someone would want a blue belt and I had a green belt, you know. So there was a complexity of, of how do you hold. Uh, then I started working out that I could print on the belts, you know, if I could print things on the belts. And I found that some of the, especially the government organizations, they didn't... Uh, they didn't necessarily have the, the capital, the funding to be able to. They wanted the system, the most efficient system mm -hmm. in the world, but they couldn't afford it. So I came up with a concept of, of giving, providing them the systems, but then owning the advertising rights or the branding rights of the systems. Okay. So then I built a new business, a newity business. So when you went to the airport, you'd be standing in a system that was branded by a hotel or an airline or a rental car rental company. And the system belonged to me. I got paid rent for it every single month. I maintained the system. And I built that as a second part. So I became the manufacturer of it, the system, and then obviously the beneficiary of this uh, annuity income, which were later sold. You know, were, the, the businesses were later sold on, uh, uh, sold off, I should say, and one of them went into the prime media stable. And kind of then I got into the world of media. I, I spent the best part of about 10 years there. Okay, well, that sounds interesting. I mean, I, I connected up with you to talk about uh, performance vehicles and Dakar Rally, and I'm getting a, a lesson in business too. I think it's great to have this vision forward, and, uh, and this is a real take home for me that you know, you, you, you have an idea or you see something and you go for it. But very soon thereafter, you realize, well, this thing can morph into something bigger or better, and you realize that this product on its own is not, it's not sustainable, it's not good enough. I want to make it better. And, and uh, well done. So you venture down that route, and that takes you to, towards media. So then, was there a chunk of time in media before you then got into to race cars? Well, well, tell me a bit about that that next journey. Yeah, so if I go back to the point I made that I, there was this void. There wasn't the sporting, this competitive side. Um, there wasn't a differentiation factor for me. So I needed to find that. And um, I found that in motorsport, basically. I found the fact that uh, I started, uh, I was asked to test the car once uh, from bikes. I wasn't too impressed with them. I thought they, uh, they made a lot of dust and they were particularly slow. Um, and then got to test it. So I, I went for a test in, in 19, kind of 1998. I went in for a test. I did, I literally did three kilometers. It was the greatest thing I'd ever done in my life. Uh, it was that simple. I, I got out, we still wrote checks in those days. I got my wife to give me the checkbook and I horribly overpaid for the car. You know, it was, uh, they saw me coming. And that was the start of the journey, you know. And in the first year, spent a lot of money. It's an expensive sport. Spent a lot of money doing it. And, and my, my business partner, who was my navigator, kind of said to me, there's a good chance we'll end up in a council house if we carry on like this, you know. And um, yeah, he said, so you're the marketing guy. What are you going to do and how? And I, I said to him, the only way to do this is to commercialize the seat because every time we go testing, you know, friends and associates would jump into the seat and it would be the most incredible experience that they could possibly have. So we learned to monetize the seat effectively, and, and that's kind of, I learned to bring the business and the sport together. So, uh, you know, while we were running a motorsport program, we were also providing a lot of corporate entertainment, which we still do today. You know, we're probably the biggest when it comes to that. Okay. I mean, that's, a, that's another fascinating angle to, I mean, the, the goal is to build something great, but you know that there's value. I mean, that smile on your dial after that, uh, you know, that's a feeling that's, uh, 
only comes with a certain couple of events like going for a flight in a, in a fast jet or those kind of experiences. You've got to see the value. In order to keep the jet running, you need to be able to get someone to pay for the flight. And, and, and I love that, how you, how you tied it together. You know, we're not all just about racing and results, and, uh, but, but think of it differently. Can you approach this from a different angle to still race, to still build something, to have a budget and get someone else to pay for it. It makes you think like uh, Donald Trump and is uh, going to get the Mexicans to pay for the wall. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that, uh, that 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 was you at all, but, but just this, no, think sure. differently and think business, and uh, and that's fascinating. Okay, so that was then obviously the, the taste into get someone else to help you pay for it, and is that where Redline then started, or was there another step before before that journey? Um, no, that was kind of, uh, you know, at that moment in time, we, we, we had a look at, uh, we were spending a lot of money on racing and obviously what partners could we bring in and how. And I remember the first deal that I ever did, the, it was impossible for me to present the concept or the emotion over PowerPoint, you know, it was, it was just not going to happen. So it was a lot of uh, hard convincing on the phone to get to one of the marketing directors at the time of a, one of the big corporates to come out and meet me on site, you know get into an overall, uh, trust me to do a, a, a loop with him, uh, you know, which was about 5Ks and he came out, he was, he was absolutely shaking. It was, uh, his adrenaline was running really, really high. And I kind of said to him, uh, you know, that's what I, I could never get it across in a PowerPoint. I could never get that across in a boardroom. So, you know, obviously I was grateful, grateful for him coming out. But now that you understood the emotion, I want you to provide that emotion for his customer base with the right profile, obviously, you know. A lot of the big corporates are, you know, golfers to golf, uh, rugby players to rugby. Um, but what were they doing for the adrenaline guys? So when they profiled their customers, what would they do to entertain those guys? Because, you know, lunches are lunches and golf days are golf days. But where's the differentiation factor? And that's what sold it. And we built that and uh, we ran it for the best of five years. You know, we ran it under National Mobile, which was a, a big corporate at the time. And then we moved into the Imperial Stable uh, and we ran a similar model, but a much higher level. So we would go, uh, we would go racing around the, the country, um, but with a whole lot of people tagging along for uh, the experience, you know. So we'd have like, we'd go to Sun City and, and race in the area, and we'd have like 50 rooms at, the, at Sun City, with 30 of them being guests. And they would be part of the journey, you know, they'd, they'd have team dinners, they'd, they'd see the cars being maintained, they'd see the car being prepared, they'd see it being raced. And that was the commercial angle, which made it uh, a lot more reciprocal, you know, versus a... I hate the word sponsor, I prefer the word partner. Yeah. You know, it tends to be one way. The partnership's reciprocal, so um, you know, you would, they would part with product or money, but for that they would get a whole lot of uh, really, really high level, you know, very much like in your space, the people getting these exclusive flights, you know what I mean? They, yeah. It's the ticket you can't buy. It's, it's opportunities you wouldn't otherwise have access to. So we built it, we built it like that until, until 2012. And then in 2012, I, I had an aspiration of Dakar, and that's what I wanted to do. I went to uh, around the world, uh, not so much around the world, particularly around Europe, which was supposed, supposedly strong, to look at some manufacturers of what car I wanted to purchase, uh, but was very disillusioned at the quality of the cars, you know. And then she came back to South Africa and thought, geez, you know, it's actually be better just to build a car, right? because, you know, to really get something in Europe. Um, you, I, I don't think we understand how good we are or how capable we are in South Africa. And only when you start traveling, you realize how good we are and how well we're respected around the world. And then I just use the simplicity of, um, you know, if you're building a house, you get a really, really good architect. Then you get a really, really good builder. You get a good electrician. You get a good plumber, good, a good interior designer. And you'd have a really, really good house and a good property in a good location. So what would be different here? I need to get a good engineer, a good couple of engineers, which is what I did. And uh, I had a, the car built to the regulations. Um, and I built two cars, which was ideally for myself and my brother-in-law to go to Dakar. But the program became so well was was successful so quickly that the, one of the two cars was sold before it actually was six months ago, and and that kind of derailed, derailed and that was in twenty October twenty twelve. Okay, well, look, you've said so many things now, Terence. Uh, I want to try and pick up on some of them, but I don't want to lose the momentum here. So the first thing that I want to echo your sentiment is this: like you go around the world and you realize. South Africa actually has a lot going for it. Like we, we're quite quick to be a second-rate country and, and to stand back for some you know, fancy European or American. But actually, you know, we, we can hold our own in lots of things. If you look at sport, if you look at some of the business entrepreneurial ventures, I mean, I wasn't aware until you, know, you, you came across my part in the last month that uh, such a big chunk of the cars uh, that take part in DAC are, are, are manufactured here. I mean, it's an amazing thing. So it's a great realization and also just for, for the people listening as well to, to say, look, 
don't step back for anyone. You know, lean in hard. What you're doing is good. And, and don't think because someone's American or European that they could be doing it better than you. I mean, I think that's an example I can think of is, um, uh, you know, also we, the other part of it is that we're quite critical of ourselves. As South Africans, we say, you know, we're just South Africans or we only, if only we were in America or, you know, we can't get anything right. Well, last year I had an opportunity to, to head off to France and uh, to go and do some training at Airbus in Toulouse. And that was uh, the day after we'd run the World Cup. Now, that was a Sunday and I was at the airport on Sunday night and there was the, the Sunday Times, you know. We, we won the World Cup the third time we've won it and it's wonderful celebration. And you know how the, the Sunday Times folded over and the top, the top piece of the front page that's now folded over. There's the, obviously there's a photo of the trophy and the flares and it's beautiful. But right underneath it, above the fold, there's a bold letter, something like, um, so, you know, South African Airways head of technical in a scandal. So we couldn't even give the spring box that full page above the, the fold to just enjoy and the country and everything. We had to put a scandal just under that picture too. The next day I landed in France and uh, I went to this little hotel that I was staying at and there was a little uh, corner shop down the road and I went to go and get some milk and some snacks for the room. And there was the, now it's Monday. There was Monday morning's paper in the small town in Toulouse, or well, smallish town Toulouse, uh, with a full page spread of the Springboks won the World Cup. They were more proud of us winning the World Cup than we were, you know, and, and you know, this speaks to the same thing. We, we should celebrate more of what we do and we, we are good and we're capable and we should, we should celebrate it. And, and that's part of the reason why I have conversations with you today to say, look, we can do it and we are doing it. So uh, yeah, and, and thanks for sharing that. That's amazing. Pleasure. So okay, so now you've uh, you, the other thing that you, you mentioned was the um, this idea that okay, so you built a business around uh, for five years before you became this this situation now where you now building race cars for other people. Were you building race cars to actually take part in rally then too in that five year period? Were you racing, or was no, it just so the, a the, pro, uh, business? No, we we started in the national. I started racing nationals in nineteen ninety eight. Uh, so for 21 years, we, I've been racing the Nationals. Um, probably, I think I've done more than 130 events to date, which is the most, uh, the most by any individual, you know, that they can count or record. So, um, yes, been very, very active. But the objective was obviously trying to see what we could do overseas, you know. And uh, initially, the first car we built, uh, we, 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 we won the championship with. We won the championship in 2005, which was a two-wheel drive car, not the, the new Dakar spec ones now. We obviously came back 15 years and yeah. um, only, only that was 2005, 2006. And then about 2012 is when I really wanted to get into the four wheel drives and really with this, this Dakar aspiration. And that's when, as I said to you that I'm fortunate enough now for the last five years in our business, six years, I do nothing but travel. So there's not a country that I possibly haven't been to, whether it's been part of a supporting event, racing an event, um, seen a customer. And uh, as you said, I, I still say, guys, you have no, I don't think we understand how strong and how good South Africans are. Only when you travel, and even whether it's the mighty America, whether it's any of those European countries, there's no reason for us to stand back um, from a, let's say, a technology or ability, particularly attitude. Uh, in, in Dakar, if I touch on that quickly, the most sought after person in Dakar is a South African because oh, they really? know how we can handle conflict, uh, how we can pressure, how hardworking we are. So they're very, very sought after. Okay, and does that come from all walks of life, whether it's the driver, navigator, technician, support, strategy, is it on all spheres or particularly on the drivers? No, so no, no, on, uh, in, if I talk about Dakar, Dakar, I'll talk more technical, you know, the guys, okay. they just know that the South African is, he's, he's, he's had to put up a lot with his time, you know, he's used to, uh, uh, he's used to hard times or whatever, difficult times, let's put it that, you know, to get through a day in South Africa is a challenge. So yeah. Dakar is not difficult. For us, you know, so you know the thing, the normal, the normal curveballs that uh, the guys are thrown in Dakar um, is 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 it will upset people over a period of fourteen days because how can you maintain that 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 intensity, that hard work in those conditions for fourteen days? For a South African, it's just an adventure, you know, where the rest of the guys uh, are really really strong. You know? uh, so oh, it's that's just amazing. Not, I think it's Okay, that's amazing. All right, I do want to dive into the deck. Uh, so let's let's get into it. So, okay, 
another point that I just want to highlight, again, you know, you've seen opportunities as a professional sportsman, then you see there's an opportunity to go into business. The business, you see the opportunity for growth and, and restructure the business, and then again, to tweak it once more to build the, the sort of promotional and, uh, and, and high-tech um, events for corporates that you can then support your racing. Then you've got that aspiration of Dakar, and you build something, having looked around the world, you, you, you find a great team, a great engineer, and you build something great. Again, you recognize that if I sell this now, rather than race it myself, there might be something more stable and I can come back to racing. Is that roughly the, the thought process that took place in that, those first two vehicles? It, it was probably, there was some thought in it, but I can't say it was the big picture. When we designed and developed them, we did it straight away as left-hand drives when no one in South Africa was doing that. And everybody asked the question, why would I do that? And, and, and the thought process was very simple. If the car was to be successful, the biggest market in the world was going to be left-hand drive. When we're racing in the bush, it doesn't matter which side of the car you sit. You know what I mean? There's no lanes. Yeah. So, uh, so I designed them from the start to be left-hand drive with the vision that if this thing took off, you know, we were, we were well positioned. And uh, yeah, after, after building the first two, the project was only going to be two. It really was myself and my brother-in-law <laughs> as a project. And uh, we'll kind of see where it takes us, you know. And before we, before we finished the, the two completely, I got a call from Portugal, a guy had, had, had heard about it. So he flew in, uh, he had a look and he made a very, very generous offer for the second one that we had built. And we'd spent a lot of money on, on capital to design and build the car. So it was an opportunity to get to recover some of that capital. So we took that deal. Um, and then literally, it must have been two or three weeks later, a guy from Germany had a look at it and said, this is really great, will you build us one? And we, well, we're not manufacturers. You know, this was a team that took on a project. So, um, okay, being a businessman, thinking of economies of scale again, let's build what, would, what was car number three then. And then a, a guy in South Africa, just after that, uh, came and asked us the same thing, you know, and that's how four, we got to number four. You know, today we are, we've just delivered uh, number 38 uh, last week, you know. And that's, that's amazing. That's how it's, you know. <laughs> that's amazing. And as a nice example of when the market speaks, then you, you can choose to answer it or you can ignore it. And, you know, some people would say, wow, this is amazing. This is, I don't know why this is happening. It's such a distraction. I'm trying to race. But you're answering the market saying, yes, okay, there's something here. Let's lean in a bit there and see where it takes us. And I think it's wonderful. But what I'm curious about is, again, it goes back to the point of us being, like, we stand back for these proudly Americans and proudly Europeans. How did they know about us? How did they know that you're building this fantastic, even you finished it and somebody's phoning you from Portugal wanting to buy it. How does that information get out there? Are people looking at South Africa or where does that message come from? Yeah, you know, I think it goes back to the point I made earlier that uh, the, the influence of South Africa in Dakar is big and, and the, the recognition around the world for South Africa's ability to build these, build these cars is, is well respected, you know. And of course, it's a closed community. It's a very small community around the world. Um, very wealthy businessmen outside of your, your top, top teams, you know. Hmm. Okay, well, that's nice. And it's great then. So then you, you start building and then you start getting a bit of a track record. Okay, so I want to talk then some specific things, and, and we've got some people joining us. So Jordan has posted a comment earlier, and he's asking, Hi Terence, in the world of high-performance Dakar vehicles, I'm sure you know Neil Woodridge and Andy Gray, who race and build Dakar race-ready vehicles, super high-tech for the hostile environment you race in every year. Thanks for joining, joining us, Jordan. Is that, uh, is that the crowd there down there? You mentioned there was four teams, one down yeah. in the I think to put things in perspective is that at the moment, uh, if we looked at probably, let's say, the 10 biggest manufacturers in the world, um, and I'm just using the number 10 to get a kind of ratio, four of them are in South Africa, so more than 40%. Uh, if I carry on on that theme, in 2016 in the Dakar, there were 89 T1s. Um, now, a T1 car today is, is anywhere between four and seven, eight million rand. You know, It really is an off-road supercar. There were 89 on the starting line, and there were more, I think there were 43 off the top of my head that came out of the out of South Africa, just to give an idea that more than 40% of these cars were, were manufactured or designed in South Africa. So it's a very, very incredible uh, stat. So yeah, you've got, you got Neil Woolwich, which uh, they do a hell of a job of building the Fords. Uh, um, really, really good, lots of heritage, um, um, very knowledgeable, experienced guys. they based in Maritzburg. And then you've got uh, Hall Speed, which is uh, basically within a one kilometer radius in Kailami in Johannesburg. You've got the three other main manufacturers, which is uh, is ourselves. Um, you've got Hall Speed, which is Toyota, which are the biggest. They are. That's incredible what they've put together over the years. They really are. They kind of lead. 
they influenced and lead to the point that they, they won a Dakar a couple of years ago. And then there's another company called WCT, which also absolutely world-class cars. So any one of those four could stand comfortably anywhere in the world with their cars on display and be at the highest level. Mm, okay, well, that is, yeah, I mean, it's incredible to have that sort of 40% plus South African. Wow, it really is, it, it makes me feel good and positive about the country, you know, to hear these kind of things. And I'm really glad that I've had the opportunity to meet up with you on this. So to, to just talk a bit Dakar and rally in general for, for a moment. So the Dakar has been starting sort of late 70s and ran till 2007 on that sort of Paris Dakar route. Then there was that pause. In 2009, it went to South America. And now this year, it went to Saudi Arabia. Now, just off the top of your head, you know, Mauritania is part of the world, up around through Africa, South America, Saudi. Is there any particular which is worse, harder, better, easier? What are, what are your thoughts on, on where the routes are and what they have been before? Okay, so the first one, I, I, I went to Africa once in 2004, Mauritania, Senegal. I, I did that. I, I, that was my first one. I woke up in December, uh, one morning in December with Dakar coming, and I thought, you know, I can't do this. I have to go watch this. So uh, I got my PA on the phone. I made sure she got a bookings for those same four guys that I told you that go and do these trips. Um, to watch sporting uh, um, games, and uh, we all we went off to Dakar. Uh, so with a good insight into into Africa, which is very simply the African one is typically Africa. You can't get more remote connectivity; doesn't exist. Uh, mm. It's the arse end of the world. It's just you can't. Africa's Africa. I don't think we have to we have to really explain that one. You know. Mm -hmm. Then I went uh, of the eight that I've been to. The next batch was all in in South America. So we went through places, Bolivia, Chile, Chile uh, Peru, Argentina. But the reality is South America, I, I don't think I've seen poorer countries. I mean, it really is. That's as third world as you can get. Um, you literally are moving from townships to townships from an South African point of view to give an idea um, how bad South America is. Uh, it's obviously really, really hot. Uh, we had all kinds of conditions. Um, I, I spent the one year in Bolivia where I think I honestly believe the the end of the world is just on the other side of Bolivia because I've never been to, I've never been to a place that's that that poor and that bad, you know. So we spent years in South America and it were it was very challenging logistically, uh, time zones, connectivity, transport, roads, um, language non-existent. You can travel for two weeks and be lucky to find someone who speaks broken English, you know. Food was horrible. Uh, Hotels, it just it was horrible. South America was as tough as you can probably get, but more more infrastructure than, than Africa. The first one, Saudi Arabia, this the, this last year, this year now in twenty nineteen was um, twenty twenty with the first one was absolutely superb, next level. Okay, you got a Saudi Arabia. They got all the terrain you could wish for in one country. Uh, the only other country that I've seen have that much terrain in one country was China. I've been to China a couple of times, but Saudi Arabia was they have all the landscape that you could ever want without having to cross borders. Um, road networks are superb. Connectivity from a, from a phone perspective, and uh, let's talk about Wi-Fi and media, is absolutely superb. Um, temperatures are great because it's that time of the year where they're kind of mid-20s, you know, um, okay. you're outside of the summer. And your infrastructure, you've got whenever you need fuel, there's fuel. You know, you need hotels when you stop. Communication, just about everybody speaks English. So the Saudi Arabia Dakar is a lot easier from a logistics point of view than, than any of the others. The hardest would have been Africa. Um, South America was obviously challenging. But yeah, and obviously it's a lot easier. It's, it's harder on the teams, but in, in terms of the race environment, where, where would you put the three? The actual hard on the vehicle, hard on the drivers, hard on the navigators. Where, where would you stack them up in that, in that respect? I, I, I can't say I'm experienced enough to, con to, to comment on, on, on Africa, but obviously Mauritania, the sand, the desert. South yeah. America, definitely some really, really tough. You know, I'm fortunate enough to have driven in the dunes of, of, of Peru, which is really, really difficult. Um, Abu Dhabi, which is probably the most complicated dunes that you can have. China, the Gobi Desert, which is really, really challenging on its own. And now mm. Saudi. And I would think from what I've seen, just on the one, um, they didn't bring enough deserts or dunes into the Saudi one. Um, there was a little bit too flat. So from a driver terrain perspective, the last Dakar was a little bit easier than they would have liked, a little bit, a little bit too open and too fast, uh, which had a big influence on the results. Um, but I think this year, from what I can see now, they, they will be changing that up, you know? Um, so again, they they've got a lot of terrain in South America. Yeah, sorry, say that again about South America? 
they started running out a bit of terrain there, you know, because what happened is, do you understand that Dakar, it's a very, very simple thing. The, the Dakar is run by an organization called ASO. ASO also own the rights to the Tour de France. So the Dakar is a very simple thing. It's a television show. It's a television show that they will go into your country, you pay them a whole lot of millions of dollars, and then they, from your tourism budget, and then they will showcase it on their television show. Uh, they have almost, you know, they, somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5 billion viewers in, in the month of January when there isn't really any other competitive form of sport. So that's the, that is the, really what the Dakar is all about. So they don't really give, they're not too interested in, in, in spectators. It's not a critical part of their, their, their business. And obviously when they were going through South America, you know, Peru would give them $3 million. Then they go to Chile and they get another $3 million. And that's kind of what they would do. And then they would charge all their actors, their performers, or all charge entry fees as well. And that's their kind of business model. And uh, the, tougher they, it's, the tougher they make it, the more attractive it is. I've never seen something that the idea is, the more attractive it is to the competitor. You know? And we want to tough them a bit hard. But what happened with South America being so poor was, um, you know, Chile didn't have money, uh, Argentina didn't have money anymore. So no one could afford them to, to go to South America. And their biggest single cost was broadcasting fees because you had this seven, eight hour, nine hour uh, gap. So by the time they'd shot the day's footage, they still needed to, you know, put that edit and put that show together, then still get it across the world uh, for those time zones. So coming to, to Saudi Arabia with the European time zone is massive reduction in broadcast fees and costs and uh, transfer costs of content, you know. And then obviously mm. Saudi Arabia, uh, to understand their model, they want to move away from oil, they're becoming more westernized, they've opened up, they're holding all these sport events. So the Saudis just came and gave a, a massive check and said, okay, bring your circus here, you know, we want to open our country up to the world. You broadcast to, to uh, 1.3 billion people, you generally come with somewhere between 50 and 60 nationalities will arrive on our shores. Uh, we'll provide all the hospitality and those 50 nationalities and 4,000 people that make up the Dakar Bivyak will go, hopefully go back into their own countries and say, Saudi Arabia is somewhere you should be going into the future. That's the simplicity of the strategy. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it is a business model that's been rolling around for a couple of years now. And you know, I didn't really think about it, in that, but it makes sense. You know, Dakar rally showcasing countries. That's a great insight. Okay, so uh, the Dakar obviously is a big event, like the Tour de France, but like the Tour de France, there's other cycling events, there's Giro d'Italia, you know, the Tour Down Unders and all those things. So uh, if somebody is a rally driver uh, and Dakar is this rally endurance event, uh, are they competing all year round and aiming for the Dakar, much like the Indy 500 or the sort of Monaco in Formula One? Uh, or maybe Formula One is not a good example, but, but what, are the, what are the teams doing all year round? I mean, is it a, a focused team on Dakar or are they racing all year round and Dakar is just the... A specific event that they look at. So, so Dakar would be the iconic one. That's the the one the most sought after around the world. That's everybody's. It's obviously a very expensive exercise, but it remains the most aspirational. I mean, if, if I have to explain to anybody in, in in South Africa or around the world what we do, uh, as soon as I use the word Dakar, they join the dots. If I use the word cross country or rally raid, I have to go further in depth to try and explain what we do. You know. Because they think is it four by four? Is it raining? They don't. You know that, that, that kind of idea or concept isn't there. As soon as I go Dakar, it links everything. So that remains the most aspirational. Um, a lot of the guys will race within their their own national championships. Okay. okay. But in places like Europe, they really, really don't have any uh, land. I mean, uh, we delivered a car to Germany three months ago. He still hasn't got the ability to test his car. The poor customer just spent three hundred thousand euro on the car, but he's got no terrain. You know, we think how blessed we are with terrain. So yeah. most of the guys, Dakar would be your biggest. Um, thereafter, there's a couple of events that try and take out. There's one called uh, the Oriental Dakar, which is in China, which is a 10-day event. Then they've got the Silkway Rally, which is kind of Russia through China. They have that one. Yeah. Those, are your, those are your really, really big, I'm talking about 10-day plus kind of events, uh, 5,000 yeah. kilometers, 10,000 kilometers. Then you get the, the FIA, which is the International um, series and they have one which is cross-country rallies which is three to five days and there's probably four or five of them on the international calendar and then obviously what they call the world cup bars which is another series which is really just a two-day race and probably about 500 you know from a south african point of view the the most professionally running competitive championship in the world is in south africa oh really uh, the south african rally championships cross-country okay, so, cross 
All right. Well, that's good to know. Again, again, celebrating South Africa. Proudly South African, the comments are coming in. Oh, South yeah. Africans have grit. I agree with you. Yes. Okay. So um, as far as you, you've now sold 38 cars and you support them. So, so tell me, with going back to the Dakar specifically for a bit, I do want to talk other rally as well, but Dakar. So they say about 80% of the entries are amateur and you've sold uh, many cars to private individuals, wealthy businessmen who want to give this a go. And then you support them in the race as well as, a, as Redline. You, you go there and you make sure that this team goes from A to B. So tell me your role as a support team on someone who's you know, got a lot of money, buys himself a car and wants to race. Uh, are, are all your, I mean, how many of your cars that have you sold are taking part in the rally? How many took part this year in, in Dakar? So in Dakar to date, so Dakar to date, we've taken 10 cars to Dakar, of which eight have finished and two, okay. two crashed out. Uh, two crashed out with one of the customers crashing out on the second last stage, you know. So we, we very proud. We have an incredible record from a finishing ratio. And, and the objective was always to build cars that could, to, could finish what is referred to as the toughest motorsport event on the planet. So if we could, if we could build, design, uh, and manufacture a car could finish that, then there, there's no question of your credibility anywhere else in the world. So that's why, why we set our standards on, on that, you know. So our customer base, 35 to 65 years old, uh, the guys would be wealthy businessmen somewhere in the world. Um, they have a sense of adventure, uh, bucket list experiences that they want, whether that's on a World Cup stage, uh, whether it's in Dakar, uh, depending on their budgets. And we basically become that conduit. We facilitate that process. So we, uh, our strength is, our, is taking an amateur or a beginner and turning him into a, in, into a semi-professional. So whether it's the, the car, first and foremost, it's the car, but then obviously there's a driver training that's required. Two different disciplines, cross-country racing is a completely different discipline to dunes. So we'll do training across both of those. Um, and then obviously the navigation training. And then obviously the technical support for these events. That's where we will contract out our technicians to events around the world. Or what happens is we will bring their technicians to South Africa where we train them over a period of a week or two weeks to be able to manage the car or those cells around the world. Okay, so if, if somebody, if a wealthy businessman comes in from anywhere in the world, he arrives at your offices, you could give him from zero to hero between now and, and a year's time, the deck or 18 months time, all, everything in between. There's your car, there's the training, there's your team, and we'll support you in the race. I mean, that's like a one-stop shop for a life experience over the next year. 100%, that bucket list experience. That's yeah, exactly that what in 2016, we had a, a, I met a guy on a plane who, whose goal was the Dakar. I had no idea he was English until he ordered, we were in South America at the time. He, he ordered these drinks on the plane next to me and I realized he was English and he was South African. And uh, we came back to South Africa, we caught up two months later. Uh, he gave me an idea of his goals and his objectives and we, we embarked on a two-year journey. And uh, two-year journeys was two years of the South African Championship. He'd never been off-road, he owned Ferraris. He'd never been on a mountain bike, so he'd never been off-road anywhere. And two years, I think we went to Namibia three times. We had two uh, two seasons of the South African Championship. We took him to Dakar to his dream. He finished 34th, I think 34th or 36th overall on his, wow. his Dakar. And that was, that's the journey. That was uh, the goal, you know, the cut and bucket list ticked off. He, he went from there to go and fly uh, uh, helicopters and then we'll, we'll be coming back into the future. That's the... <laughs> That sounds amazing. To, to I mean, to, to build something that is that quality, but also to give someone that 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 dream or that back, bucket list experience. That must be an amazing thing. You know, I I, I find it in uh, when I was a flying instructor in the Air Force, helping someone learn to fly, giving them their dream. It is an amazing thing at the end. You know, giving them their wings, or you know, the guy takes part and he finishes thirty third. Now, what is it? I saw at some point up to five hundred odd entries. What is it sitting at now? Like thirty third. How many people are starting at the the starting no, line? At the I had a look at the injuries the other day. There's uh, there's seventy five percent of their normal, so they're twenty five percent down. Obviously, a lot of the privateer guys don't want it during this COVID, so they are down. But obviously, most of the the bigger teams are there. You know, if I if I just pick up on what you said about the the ability to facilitate this process for the customers, that's the that's the nice part of it. You know, passing on, yeah. um, mentoring, guiding. You know, uh, getting people to live their dreams. That's the nice side. The difficult side is dealing with these guys because. You must understand, but you know, 35 to 65 year old guys, they are egos, they are attitudes, they are, uh, that's the, the, the difficult, let's say, the side of the business, you know, because you've got, they're mavericks. Every one of our customers are maverick. He's a very wealthy guy. He's been influential. He's very influential. He's a decision maker. He's an influencer. 
and yeah. uh, now you've got you've got to handle him. He doesn't play well with others, so you can't put him in groups. So yeah. well, there's a, there's pretty a pretty there's there's a lot of challenges along the way as well. And he's uh, also he put a bit of petrol into the mix and some uh, kilowatts and torque and yeah, yeah recipe for success. <laughs> yeah. um, so we've got another uh, a, a school friend joining Jeremy Thompson joining us from LinkedIn saying awesomely inspiring uh, media king. You were a, a year ahead of me at Banoni High. It's from Jeremy Thompson joining us. Thanks for Good. sharing your comment there, Jeremy. Okay, so now some specifics on uh, on actually building a car now. So you said your goal a few minutes ago. Said your goal is to build cars that finish the Dakar, so that people know if you've got credibility finishing Dakar, and I think it's amazing to have eight out of your ten cars finish and uh, two crashed out. So that, again, not a mechanical issue. So let's say of, of your cars that could have finished 100% finished. Now that's incredible. Like, uh, is there a tougher race? on earth than the Dakar type event, whether it's in Africa, South America, or Saudi. I, I, I can't think of one. But tell me, what, what is your approach to this thing? Do you build it as solid and reliable as possible? Do you have a hybrid between performance and weight? I mean, just tell me some specifics. Let's get into the weeds of, of building a car to last. Let's, we start from that framework, and then we're building a car to performance. OK, so, so when I first started in the sport, uh, you know, I think the finishing ratio was somewhere around 50%. So 50% of the time, you'd be sitting next to the road waiting for somebody to recover you, you know, baking in the sun, hungry, you know, you probably probably your feet in your overall. And I, and I started looking at this before from a business perspective, you know, this doesn't make sense. You spend all this money for, for, for this, you know, for these kind of returns. It didn't make sense. So that's the first time that I decided uh, it was, geez, it was probably 2003 or 2002. The first one in South Africa to just employ a full-time mechanic, I said, because everything was always contracted out. It was a very amateur sport. And I said, no, what we needed to do to get a better return on, on our investment was I wanted more seat time and I wanted more kilometers, okay? So uh, you can imagine if you're flying and, uh, you know, every 50% of the time your, your plane's going down. It's, you're not going to be flying too often. So uh, it was with that in mind. I wanted seat time and I wanted, uh, I wanted uh, kilometers because whatever I was spending, I wanted to divide it by hours of seat, seat time and I wanted to divide it by kilometers. And the lower the ratio was, the better my return was. So it was that in mind that I decided uh, I wanted reliability more than forget performance. What does the performance matter? If you're breaking yeah. down or you know there's more errors, what does the performance? It means absolutely nothing. In the world of endurance, reliability is everything. So yeah. that was where we bought. I wanted everything. Let's not say over-engineered because you still got to worry about things like weight and all that kind of stuff. But strength and reliability was number one. And when I when I I, I tasked the team initially, it was on, on that. I wanted nothing more than finishing. They got zero budget for performance, zero. They were given nothing. We were privateers, no development budget for performance, just reliability. And it, it was based on that. And once we got the reliability over a couple of years, then I released some funding to say, okay, now let's see if you can make it go a little bit faster, you know? And, and that was kind of, that's, that's been the way we set it up always. And we've and I think our, our record kind of speaks to that. There's, there's not a World Cup event in the world that we haven't finished. There's not an international event in the world that we haven't finished. So we have a very, very credible CV, but it was based on that strategy, you know? Okay, well, that's a, that's a different approach, particularly if you're in racing. I mean, okay, so you, you do have, not the, it's not a caveat, but I mean, the, the, the lens of this whole thing is endurance racing. Now, I spent a, a couple of years just doing very part-time, very, very amateur racing of the F400 carts, the 400cc four-stroke around Joburg, etc. And it was all endurance racing. It was 90 minutes or a, uh, a 240 minutes race. And it's in teams and relays, etc. We did some through the night, 12-hour events too. But, you know, you can you can shave those uh, lap times, shave a half a second and you can go for it. But if, you, if you're trying to shave off half a second on a lap and you spin and you lose 20 seconds getting your tires warm again, you know, that half a second meant nothing. You've just lost half a lap. So I agree, you know, it doesn't help sitting on the side of the road with a super fast car. You want to finish the race and, and you're going to beat people with a super fast car who are sitting on the side of the road. So it's a great approach. But it is a little counterintuitive to say, let's first finish and we take it from there when you're in racing. Did people think you were, had lost the plot? Or, I mean, how do you approach that with your team and the competitors? Yeah, I think there's, I mean, it's been, a, it's been an interesting journey because a lot of people would say, you know, the old theory in, in racing is what wins on Saturday, sells on Monday type of thing. And why aren't you uh, pushing, um, you know, results more? And just being a businessman, I always just said, guys, the reality is it's, we're a private business. We are 100% privately owned. I don't have any financial or factory backing whatsoever. So uh, everything I'd seen in racing before, and I did some track racing in my time as well, is it's just a big black hole. It just never ends. You know, once you get into that, 
chasing that half a second and chasing, as you see in the Formula Ones, it, it just never ends, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the results don't come, you wake up on a Monday morning and you're miserable, you're miserable and you're poor. So, you know, I it came around in about 2008. I, you know, I'd won the championship in 2005 and uh, six and seven was obviously still trying to compete at the highest level and was always finishing the top three in South Africa, which was great. But I found it quite a big emotional roller coaster, you know, a lot of money. And if you didn't get the results, you know, doing, you know you're going to, going to work on money in a bad headspace. The family wasn't great. And I kind of, kind of reviewed back life and said, is this really what I wanted? This is, you know, work was stressful enough. This was my out. This is what I went yeah. away to you go away with teams, your, your, your navigators, your mates. Uh, you've got your family around you. You've got your kids around you. Um, you've got your mates around you. Um, there was more. I wanted, I wanted more of that out of it. So mm -hmm. I decided then to, to concentrate more on the adventure. So when, we, when I put a helmet on, I would still be as competitive as I, I, I could be. But outside of that, I changed my mindset to, to rather be in weekends of adventure. And as I said to you, the more you spend, it's just, it's a, it, you, it doesn't end. It doesn't end. Yeah. Yeah. So well, we've kind of concentrated. Said, if I look at my customer base, he wants to finish. He cannot drive our cars to seventy percent of their ability. You know, I think uh, I think I'm. You know, with uh, if we put one of the top drivers in one of our cars in, in in the world, we know we could probably finish in. Let's not say the top five, but the top ten. You know, we've we've had stage times that have been there. But the reality is that the professional guys or the fast guys don't have the money. They want sponsorship. Where does that sponsorship come from? You know. Yeah. Where the guys with the money, the guys with the money in our world, and we follow the money. That's the reality of it. We follow the money. You know, if yeah. somebody's quite happy to come write a development budget out, you know, yes, we could go and chase. But you, all you ever do is, you know, you building more and more exhausts. So we're somewhere in between. You know, as as we are now, we've been one of the bigger players in the world. We're probably one of the top three in the world now from a size perspective. We still control the blend of endurance and performance. And not just okay. performance because we, we don't have the funding, Alex. We just don't have that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so then in terms of uh, of building a car that is reliable, you said you're going to build it soft. What do you practically do to make it more reliable? What did you change from a 50% when uh, finish to 100% finish? You know, or up to 90, 100%. What practically? Like, do you, do you put a bigger spring? Do you put a bigger air filter? What is the the things that you did that makes the car more reliable car? Well, well, that's been independent. So my number one objective is when I first when I first got the team to design and develop the car, remembering that I'm not an engineer, I'm just using yeah. commercial mind uh, behind yeah. it, you know? And the reality was I wanted the best componentry. So we went and looked at each of the components of the car, whether it be the suspension, uh, engine is a little bit more flexible because well, they're all good engines. Uh, but let's talk about engine management systems, which is the computer, the brain behind it all. Um, the gearbox, um, what, what was the best in the world? I wanted the best in the world. You know, we were independent. I didn't have to be influenced by anybody or anything. So I did that. I, I made a decision that I want the best componentry, so I bought the best gearbox. Um, our gearboxes today are over 500,000 Rand, but they are you know, going a whole season without touching the gearbox. Um, it's important, you know, important that the most important marriage in any car is the gearbox and the engine, because you have a massively big, strong engine, but if the gearbox is not strong enough, you just end up blowing gearboxes all day, you know? Mm. So it was really that mindset. What was the best componentry we could get? The, the chassis is geometry. That's an architect, an engineer. You design a really, really good chassis. You then bolt on the best components you, you can have, the best electronics that you can have. Then you get to probably, it's irrelevant with all the best components in the world if you don't have the best preparation. So we, we, we then put everything together, uh, being the best. Um, then 90% of our work is actually done in the workshop, not at the race. So okay. our preparation, 90%. So build a great car. That's all good and well, but if it's managed, uh, uh, not managed properly or run badly, technically, it'll be parked on the side of the road. That's the simplicity. Mm. Well, First of all, let's get the car. I like the, 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 the way you sort of zoomed in on, on the preparation. So, so what is the kind of preparation that you do? Because I see high performance teams, you know, they build on incremental gains. How do you do that? You, it's a three step process of thorough preparation, execution with precision and then review. Uh, like in, a, in an event like the Dakar, there isn't much opportunity to review. So I presume that you're doing sort of refinement on on, uh, on trial runs and testing and stuff while you're at the factory side of things. So, so what's the kind of preparation that you do to ensure that the team is ready for, for an event like Dakar? Your Dakar would be a massive preparation of the car going to Dakar. 
Um, so the actual setup of that particular car, every single component is test, tested, every uh, uh, the preparation nut bolt is checked, marked. So your preparation lead up to Dakar is big. Then you obviously go into maintenance. Now you're maintaining it after every stage every day. But remembering that you're having minimal sleep, a privateer will come in at uh, you know, 4 o'clock after stage 1. By stage 2, he's been pushed out, he's getting at 5, 6 o'clock. By the third or fourth day, he's getting at 8 o'clock at night. You know? Now your technicians are working later, they're getting less sleep, and the next day they're having to move to the next bivouac. So basically what the Dakar does, it just slowly, slowly, you know, just, it, it just takes the life out of you, squeezes the life out of you every day, you know? Because every day you will work harder, uh, with less time and have less sleep. So by the time you get to the rest day, you're out on your feet, okay? Now, obviously, that's when the mistakes start creeping in because the guys are getting tired. They go into detail. So uh, those are where you're really, really going to be on top of your game. Uh, rest day is like half time uh, in a sense of the, the, the rally stops for a, a, a day, but it's a rest day for the drivers and navigators because they stay in the hotels. For the technical guys, there is no such thing as a rest day. The only rest oh, they right. ever have is, is, is when they sit in the car for one bivy to the next and they sleep in the car. That's it. Rest day is a full rebuild. So it's a full rebuild of the car um, to go and take on the second week of the Dakar, you know. So preparation, attention to detail, working in very, very tough, dusty, windy, rainy conditions. Um, you know, how do, how do we get our guys to continuously be focused with all that kind of noise around it? You know, generators, uh, cars, dust, wind. Um, yeah, that's what that's the deck off. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like an incredible test of if anyone's um, sort of patience or endurance or ability to just hang in there. Never mind the fact that you're trying to actually complete this uh, event, but just to just be there, just to sit in a tent in that environment must be heavy going. You know, it sounds like sort of army days. <laughs> um, so, okay, so it, it sounds it really, Terence, it sounds fascinating and uh, and incredible. Now, just one other thing I wanted to ask you regarding this sort of principle of incremental gains and just trying to be a little bit better than, than you were the day before. So if you're constantly looking at what other people are doing, I don't think you're going to make much progress. You'll, you'll, you'll try and copy what they do, but how do you get ahead of them? So you need to look at what you do in order to make yourself better so that tomorrow you're better and then the results take care of itself. If you're improving just a bit today over yesterday, if tomorrow is better than it was uh, today, then you've done a good job. How is it that you are doing that in your cars, uh, whether it's new customers or new events or, or supporting in the rally itself? But what, what is it that you, Terence, and your team at Redline do to just be a little bit better every day? So, so to simplify that, we have a, um, you know, when all this hashtag language came up, uh, we mm -hmm. came up with a, a hashtag called hashtag next level. And, and basically that's up throughout our, our business and all the, the meeting rooms and in the, in the factory. And everybody's triggered on that. So every time we talk about something, we always ask ourselves, what's the next level? You know, what's the next level? If we had this particular level, so if we're making something, what's the next level from that? You know, if we're doing something, what's the next level? So we're always aspiring or talking that language. We don't always get it right, but it's our, sure. it's, it's kind of our, it's our trigger point, too, you know? One of the biggest things which interesting in our business is some of the biggest um, pushing actually comes from our customers. If you think of our customers are all high-powered, influential, left-field thinkers. Um, so we forever challenged, you know, they're not very mechanical, so the quality that comes out is not always good, but 10% of it, they're always, they're always questioning, they're always pushing. So we get quite a big push from, from each of our um, customers, you know, um, which are interesting characters. So a lot of our, let's say, our development or our ideas would have been triggered or pushed by them. We ourselves are obviously looking, but if you mm. think about the, the caliber of the customer, his whole life he's built, he's developed, he's pushed in whatever sector of business he wants. So that's the way he's wired. So when he yeah. comes and he joins up, he will always ask the hard questions. He'll always be pushing. He will always want it. That, that's what's, you know, he's always striving to be better. That's what made him successful. So yeah. um, we all have that push, con consistent push from them. Okay, well, I think that's a great place to, to wrap it up. And, and, and this hashtag next level, which you guys um, uh, celebrate, I think it's wonderful. And I can see just this conversation with you now, this hour we've talked, I can see the, the, the common thread throughout the, what you've shared, you know, being professional sports and what's the next level is to be a businessman and what's the next level on this product and what's the next level and what's the evolution. So the, the way you've been approaching life and business and, and your teamwork, it's been next level. And, uh, and now you formalize it in your current team. And I think it's great. 
So thank you so much for your time. It was really, really a, a treat, a lesson in business and on approaching life and, and next level. And I really enjoyed this, Terence. I appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we will be up again soon. Please uh, stay tuned for more high-performance teams. If you know somebody that would uh, benefit from this, please remember to share, post your comments, and uh, remember to subscribe to the show as, you, as it comes out. That's it from me.